Good day, and welcome to the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event. Our next presenting company is Staffing 360 Solutions. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Brendan Flood, Chairman, CEO, and President with Staffing 360 Solutions. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for giving of your time today at the SNN Summer Virtual Event. What I wish to bring you through is the story of an emerging company in the staffing sector. Some of you will have heard of it before, but some of you will be equally familiar with the background to how staffing companies tend to operate and tend to grow fairly exponentially over time. So I am Brendan Flood. I'm the Chairman, CEO, and President of Staffing 360 Solutions, Inc., and I will steadily move through the number of slides that we have to share with you today. You will all be very familiar with forward-looking statements, so I will move on. That's just effectively there to make sure that I don't say anything that I shouldn't say or that might embarrass me in front of our lawyers. So I would like to start by giving you a little bit of a background to the company, a little bit of background to how we operate, a little bit of background to the size of the opportunity that sits in front of us. So Staffing 360 Solutions is in a buy, integrate, build strategy mode. We operate just in the United States and the United Kingdom. We occasionally do business outside of there, but we don't create physical presence outside of the US and the UK. We've made 10 acquisitions since late 2013. We are listed on NASDAQ under the ticker symbol STAF. Uh, we're headquartered in New York. We typically pay somewhere in the order of 4,000 temporary employees every single week. And we have 200 internal staff who look after those 4,000 employees. We have two principal products, temporary staffing and permanent placement. We typically look for our revenue split to be 95-5. Uh, our revenue is prior to the payroll costs of each of our temporary workers. So when you go to look at our financial statements and look at gross profit, the gross profit is after all of the related payroll costs of each of those temporary workers. We manage our um, operations through three business streams, commercial staffing, which is principally light industrial, and professional staffing broken down between the United States and the United Kingdom, which are in four of our major verticals of accounting and finance, technology, engineering, and administrative staffing. The staffing market in the world is huge. It's $500 billion, and it grows typically at about 3% per annum. And there are 165,000 staffing companies globally, 164,999 of which you've never heard of, but Staffing 360 Solutions is now the front and center of your staffing interest. It's a very fragmented market. There are 20,000 staffing companies in the United States with less than $20 million of revenue. There is Typically, not any job that you can think of that there isn't a staffing company out there ensuring that employees are available to fill those jobs. The company is led by myself and Alicia Barker. I've been in the staffing industry for more than 20 years. Started with TMP, which was the uh, parent company of Monster.com. And we built a mid-market staffing business between 1999 and 2003 from zero revenue to 1.5 billion through a number of acquisitions in the United States, Europe, and Asia-Pac. Alicia Barker has now been in the staffing industry for more than 15 years. The biggest part of her background is in human resources, communications, and executive development. And between two of us and a number of corporate officers, we manage uh, all of our seven brands. So to bring you through some of the recent developments, every single year we have a board meeting in February, which we call our administration board meeting. And last year we had one, as we always do, and one of the standing agenda items is, what would you do and how would you react if there was a recession? So we presented a plan to the board that had a number of steps in it. And then, lo and behold, three weeks later, we find ourselves in lockdown because of the coronavirus. 
and we executed that plan exactly in the order of what we had. So it moved from what we thought was an intellectual desktop exercise to an actual practical exercise. And between the last week of March and the first week of April, we took $5 million out of our operating costs. And later in the year, at the beginning of October, we took a further $1.5 million out. So I, I put that in here just to tell you that as we, um, as we went into the pandemic, uh, we probably had more people than we needed. As we came out of it, we were significantly more efficient than we'd ever been before. But it also tells you that we do have the management team across all of our business streams that can actually execute when it's called upon. From a business perspective, we've signed up 100 new contracts in our commercial staffing business in the United States since the 1st of January. We're typically running at about 12 new contracts every single month at the moment. Our largest client is in the UK, and it's British American Tobacco. We are about to, uh, we're working our way through the legal documents to have a two-year extension to our framework agreement. Additionally, they have given us the managed service provider role, which basically means that we manage all of their recruitment for IT globally, which runs at a typically about 400 roles per annum. Now, uh, we won't fill all of those roles. We will also use other staffing companies to fill them. But we would expect that this is probably somewhere in the region of $20 million of additional revenue that we will have each year that we are in that position. With Emerson, we've signed a new agreement as well to be the managed service provider for them all across the UK and continental Europe for all of their IT recruitment. And that's going to be typically somewhere in the region of uh, 300 placements per annum. And again, we will also use some tier two staffing suppliers to assist us. Back in May of 2020, we applied for and were given uh, four loans totaling 19.4 million under the Paycheck Protection Program uh, of the CARES Act. And between May and July of this year, the entire $19.4 million has been totally forgiven. Uh, 10 million of it was in Q2's accounts. This further 9.4 million will appear when we file our third, uh, third quarter 10Q in the middle of August. There have been a number of items that have helped us to consolidate our financial position over the course of the last eight or so months. Um, between the middle of December and last week, we raised $40 million of additional common stock. We used that to pay down our long-term debt. We used it to clean up our capital structure, particularly in our prefer preference shares area. In June of 2020, between non-receivables debt and redeemable preference shares, we had $72.3 million of liabilities on our balance sheet. As of last week, we have reduced that to $13.5 million. So it's a huge difference. It's a huge cash flow burden that has been taken off our shoulders. And you'll start to see it uh, between the second quarter's 10Q that we filed yesterday and the subsequent quarters as our interest charges and our dividend charges come down materially. In preparation for some of this refinancing, we have also extended our long-term debt. So the 13.5 million that is currently outstanding uh, does not mature until September 30th, 2022. The vast majority of staffing companies use receivables financing in order to fund their payroll. And uh, the provider in the US, which is Midcap, uh, we went into a two-year extension with them last September. So that doesn't mature until September 22 also. And every year around this time, we file a one-year extension with our UK provider, which is HSBC Bank. Uh, all relationships, both with the senior debt and the receivables financing, are um, all in good shape. And we all get on incredibly well. Additionally, we took advantage of the FICA deferral program also under the CARES Act, and it reduced our cash flow by $4.8 million in 2020. This FICA deferral is effectively an interest-free loan from the U.S. government, pay, payable 50% on 
on the 31st of December 2021 and 50% on the 31st of December 2022. But through the use of the employee retention tax credit, which we have calculated we benefit 1.1 million through the end of um, Q2 2021, which will probably rise to somewhere in the region of 1.5, 1.6 million dollars by the end of this calendar year. The vast majority of the payment that would be due on the 31st of December of the current year will be forgiven. So some of the investment highlights. Um, we do have an international footprint. We do operate in a highly fragmented market, which provides numerous opportunities for acquisitions. And one of the things that we are very big on is to make sure that the client relationships that we have are very deep and are very strong. The vast majority of our top 20 clients have been with us for 10 years or more. A bit of uh, revenue progression in 2013, we were basically at zero. I think the, the total number was about $500,000 of, of revenue. We grew to 278 million pre-pandemic. We were affected by the pandemic as everybody was, but we were fortunate enough that the vast majority of our light industrial uh, activity was deemed to be essential, and therefore about two thirds of it continued all the way through without ever closing down. So we delivered 205 million in 2021. As of um, the 10Q that we just filed, we are now a couple of percentage points ahead of last year. So we've basically recovered what we had lost and the second half of the year we expect to see significant growth. As mentioned already, we do have a management team with significant operational experience. We have had a number of items that have helped us to significantly improve the financial position of the organization also. Uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but it shows a little bit of the chronology of the acquisitions that we've made. And you can see that occasionally we've taken a gap, and principally those gaps were to either integrate the acquisitions that we've made or to take another look at trying to strengthen our balance sheet to make sure that we could go through more acquisition in the future. We're focused on the United States and the United Kingdom for a couple of reasons. They, they are the two of the three largest markets in the world. The United States is first, the United Kingdom is third, we've got Japan in between, and the Japanese market is principally light industrial. Both of them have well-developed temporary staffing markets. They typically have governments that are very business friendly and therefore the labor laws are very flexible. Uh, culturally aligned, the management time gets optimized. So I mean, some people might think a five hour time difference between London and the East Coast of the United States is a lot, but if you're used to acting in an international environment, it's not really anything at all. So, because we've managed to keep the vast majority of our business in Eastern time in the United States, we, we do have the opportunity to optimize our management time to make sure that we can operate both businesses together. Our M&A focus going forward is typically going to be in the United States. The United Kingdom will grow organically. Organizational wise, this chart just shows which brands sit within each of our three business streams. Our commercial staffing is made up of Monroe staffing and key resources. Monroe staffing is mostly north of New York, and key resources is mostly in North Carolina. Lighthouse is mostly an engineering and accounting and finance brand uh, in Connecticut and North Andover, which is in northern Massachusetts. And then the three UK brands, the uh, sit between our two branches, one in central London and one in Red Hill, which is by Gatwick Airport, if you are familiar with the geography of the UK. We are very rigid about what we will do. And everything that we do is focused upon what we call our five strategic pillars. So what we want to be is experts in a particular function. So all of our, our business is driven around the skill sets of the candidate rather than the sector of the client. 
And by that I mean we'll place accountants into manufacturing, we'll place them into healthcare, we'll place them into banking. We don't really care that much what the client does, we care an awful lot about the skill set of the candidate. And we've also limited it to a handful because we want to be subject matter experts in a small number of things rather than generalists in a large number of things. So our strategic goals is to build a profitable international staffing firm and our, our public number is that we want to grow to be a $500 million profitable company. We have a very disciplined acquisition strategy. We have a number of items which I'll talk about in a few moments that if all of those items are not picked when we look at an acquisition target, we walk away. The staffing market has always been a feeding ground for M&A activity and there's, without exception, and some of them might deny it because they can't remember some of their history, but there isn't a large staffing company in the United States that is not the product of an acquisition strategy at some point in its past. We use what we call an intelligent integration approach, so we try to maximize the value where we can. If some acquisition target does something incredibly well, we'll adopt it and we'll introduce it to all of our other brands. I've already mentioned the management team, and our intention is to drive shareholder value and profitability with every single thing that we do. So every acquisition that we do must sit within one of the five strategic pillars. Occasionally somebody will come to me and say, I've got this fantastic healthcare staffing firm that you want to look at. And my typical response will be, we don't know anything about healthcare. You know, so if, um, if we knew something about healthcare, we might be interested, but we do know a lot about accounting and finance, about information technology, about engineering, about administration, and about commercial staffing or light industrial. We have a very small management team, so therefore we, we don't look at any turnarounds. If something is broken, let them go and fix it, and then they come and talk to us about potentially buying it. But what we want to do is to acquire companies that will hit the ground running, that have sustainable margins, they've got recurring revenues with the quality clients. As I said, most of our top 20 clients have been with us for 10 years or more. And similarly, we take a review of employees. So if most of the employee base hasn't been around for a number of years, then we take a view that irrespective of what somebody is telling me during due diligence, that there are cultural problems within that organization where we just walk away. We've, we really have no interest in solving somebody else's problems for them. Our objective, as mentioned, is to have 95% temporary workers because you gain an annuity stream. Typically, our light industrial temps operate for about four years at a go, and our professional staffing could be anything from six months to 18 months. I'm going to show you the, the two bottom pictures are probably the most um, important ones here. You know, many, many years ago, the vast majority of temporary staffing was light industrial. But over the course of I don't know, maybe the last 10 years or so, there's been a real shift in that the vast majority of people coming out of university or coming into the workforce don't view themselves as working in the same company for their entire careers. So you don't typically get as many people coming in and saying, I want to work for 20 years at XYZ Inc. They want to work for two years here, two years there. So the number of um, instances where professionals actually set out with a clear mandate that they will not work on a permanent basis anywhere. they will just work as contractors, take some time off, work in a contract somewhere else. is fairly phenomenal. But even still, the, the total number of people in employment in contract or temporary work in the United States is no more than about 2% of the total workforce. So when you start looking at the size of the staffing market and you think, well, it's mostly driven by temporary workers, that's only 2% of the employment base, then you get a sense that, you know, if 2% became 2.5%, this market is huge. If 2.5% became 3%, it's like phenomenally big. So there's a huge opportunity out there for ourselves and for every other staffing company 
that operates in the temporary contracting space. For those of you who remember the recession of 2008, 2009, most people said it's never going to be the same again. And the, the red line is the recovery of the jobs market following the last three recessions prior to the current one. And the recovery from the Great Depression of 2008 well, our Great Recession of 2008 was even greater than it was in the previous two. And what we will see over the course of the next six to 18 months is that the recovery from the most recent one is probably going to even outshine that red line. Um, I'm going to, going to move on from this, but this typically shows how our revenue in EBITDA has been progressing, and then we had a little bit of a spurt downwards because of the pandemic, and now we're in a growth mode again. <clears throat> the important bit here is in the middle, in our total liabilities. You know, our, our balance sheet, as at the 10Q that we filed on uh, yesterday, had total liabilities of $70.7 .7 million. Uh, because of the capital raises that we did during July and August, and also the additional forgiveness of the 9.4 million of PPP loans, our liabilities have dropped by 13 million, and our total stockholders' equity has increased by $20 million. So again, our, our balance sheet continues to get stronger and stronger. Very quickly on this one, a similar discussion, you know, our our cap table was a little bit complex, and through the course of what we've done since the end of the quarter, we've made our cap table significantly easier to understand. You know, we only have common stock out there. We've got no preference shares anymore, uh, common stock and warrants and options, which convert into common stock. So the cap table is significantly cleaner than it's probably ever been. We do win awards, and you know, part of the acquisition strategy is to make sure that everything that we buy is a quality company. So Monroe Staffing has won the Best of Staffing Award for five years in a row. The CBS Butler in the UK similarly has won the UK equivalent for FIFO. And we, we drive for this, so we, we take this very, very seriously, and we want to make sure that all of our staff understand the quality of the service that they're expected to deliver. And we make sure that our clients actually receive that service and we get regular feedback and both of these awards are based on client feedback about the quality of the service that our, our um, consultants are delivering. So the key takeaways is that we, we do have a highly focused M&A strategy. We grew from nearly zero to 278 million in 2019. Uh, the business stream realignment drives a lot of our cross-selling, our profitability, and our organic growth. We do have a very experienced management team. And the Q2 numbers that we just filed showed a 23% year-on-year revenue growth to $50 million and a 37% year-on-year EBIT, our gross profit growth, to $9 million. Um, contact sheet if you need to um, reach us, but also got Terry McInnes on the bottom right-hand side, Bibic and McInnes, who looks after all of our investor relations. So with that said, thank you very much for listening. Um, I will open it to Q&A, and I can see that there is a question. Uh, what would you say are some value catalysts for the rest of 2021 moving into 2022? Well, right now, the largest catalyst is the expected end on September 4th of the government, the U.S. government unemployment uh, stimulus checks of $300 per person per week. Uh, so our expectation is that the 10 million jobs that are empty in the United States will start to fill. and. I'm expecting the volume of activity across the, the final four months of the year and all the way into 2022 to be significantly higher. And there is, a, there is a strong possibility that the staffing industry will start to create some material records for placements made. 
against anything that has ever happened in the staffing industry in the past. So the, the biggest catalyst, I believe, is going to be the removal of the stimulus checks. The next largest catalyst is that the one difference between this recovery and past recoveries is that permanent placement is starting, uh, is recovering faster than temporary contracting, partly driven by the stimulus checks, but also partly driven by the fact that there is so much pent up demand in the client base that they can't afford to run the risk of staffing some of their projects with temporary workers. So we have started communication programs with all of our clients to make sure that they understand that we are not just a temporary staffing agency, that we do also do permanent placement or direct hire. And our expectation in our commercial staffing business stream is that the two to three hundred thousand dollars that we do annually will grow to somewhere in the region of one and a half million dollars from 2022 onwards. So they are probably the two largest catalysts that we are currently facing. Uh, we've got another question about um, doing, why have we raised so much capital over the course of the last few months? And the answer I gave to the same question on our earnings call yesterday is that one of the challenges we've had throughout the last number of years is just making sure that the financial future of the organization was, was solid. And we have had a relatively large debt burden. I told you that at the end of June last year, we had $72.3 million that we owe to either debt holders or redeemable preference shareholders. And during the course of the last six to nine months, there has been a lot of cash available in the market. So we took the opportunity to make sure that the financial future of the organization was um, solidified. So now that we're down to 13.5 million, 13.5 million is a significantly more manageable number for us than anything we've had before. So that is the reason we've done it, and um, hopefully that's clear from some of our filings. Okay, with that said, um, there are no other questions, so thank you all very much for your time, and enjoy the rest of the SNN summer virtual event. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and goodbye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the Staffing 360 Solutions presentation. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect, and have a great day.